Um, so good morning. It's a, a pleasure to see all of you today. Um, and uh, welcome to the Academy. Uh, this is my third year to come to the Academy. And I'm always grateful to Jad that he brings me. I love the experience. Um, this is not a part of the world that I had been in before. Most of my international travel has been in Latin America, uh, Mexico, Central America, South America. Uh, so I'm always happy to come here and see what an interesting and beautiful part of the country, uh, world that this is. And I'm happy that you're all here. Um, I'm going to do my best to speak slowly. I get very passionate about things that I'm interested in and sometimes I start to speed up and, and I'll try not to. Um, so, uh, as Jad mentioned, I'm from Florida International University, which is in Miami in Florida in the United States. I'm an associate professor there. Uh, I teach in the journalism and broadcasting department, primarily digital media and digital media studies. So a lot of my work is both theoretical, in terms of thinking about the structures of digital media, the political economy of digital media, and I also have a background in documentary filmmaking and I've been doing digital media production for almost 20 years now. Um, so I, I have a balance and a mix of both production, sort of uh, on the ground media work, as well as thinking more broadly in theoretical frameworks. Um, I have a couple of books and a lot of papers, and you can find them uh, on Google Scholar or on my academia.edu page. Um, these are two, um, one is about Mediated communities. Um, we wrote this as part of a lot of the work that we do in Salzburg. It's very much related to a lot of what we're learning here. You know, what is media literacy? How can we use the theories and practices of civic engagement and media production to enact change and mobilize communities and think about ways to uh, change the world uh, for the better? I can think uh, through media production and media analysis. Uh, the second book is much closer to home. Uh, it's coming out in December, published by Lexington, uh, and it's about Miami, which is the place that I call home. So you can see I'm interested in communities and the connections between the media that we produce and the places where we live. Okay? Um, and so this morning, I'm going to talk about the political economy of the news. Um, I will apologize in advance uh, in that a lot of my examples and the things I want to share with you are very Western-oriented. Um, uh, American media primarily, um, because that's the part of the world that I know. I will spend some time talking about Arab media and media in this region, but I also hope at the end we can have a dialogue a bit, because uh, I'm sure you all know much more than me. Okay? Um, I will also say that um, what I'm going to share uh, it might seem a little, a little depressing, uh, uh, it's easy to look at the big media corporations and the concentration that exists and the bias that exists, usually through commercial forces, but also political, and to feel very frustrated that, well, why are we bothering with everything that would be here if it's just five or six major corporations that control all the media, control what we think about, and what's in the news? Uh, but that's not really my goal. My goal is to really just to get you thinking more deeply about these things and what they mean, so that then you can take that into your own classrooms, into your own work, and do something with it. Um, and it's also great that today uh, my talk is going to be followed by Sangeeta and Henry, um, who are going to give you, I think, uh, maybe another perspective on how we might engage with media and imagination and what are the promises that exist out there. Okay, so I might leave you with kind of a dark view of corporate media, but then I think they're gonna help to sort of spin that around a little bit. Now I'm a little nervous having to follow um, two very large scholars in my field, or having to go before them, um, but I'm hoping that there's a connection between I'm, what I'm gonna share and um, then what they'll be doing with you the rest of the day. Um, and so uh, I, I wanna just start with a quote from uh, a major, in American media and also in global media, uh, Edward R. Murrow, um, a radio, television, and news directors association convention address that he gave in October 1958. And I'll play a piece of that uh, from a movie that was produced a few years ago called Good Night and Good Luck. And I'll talk more about why he fits in within 
uh, what I want to talk about, but he started his speech saying, saying, this might just do nobody any good. And that's sort of what I'm trying to give you a bit of caveat that, you know, I can tell you what all these structures are and I can show you a lot of examples and theories that show how oftentimes corporate media behave in anti-democratic ways, in ways that aren't really what we think of as functioning as the fourth estate as we think about it in the United States, as being a, a force for change, democratic engagement, the creation of a public sphere, dialogue, etc. But it's important to talk about it nonetheless. So what are a few key questions that I want to cover today? Well, first is, you know, what do we mean by the political economy of news production? Why is this theoretical field important when we think about different approaches to media literacy, which is what you're going to be doing here for the next week? And how can we update older models um, developed before the internet and the digital revolution uh, for this time that we live in now, for what some people call the digital age? Um, it also fits fairly well within the field of media literacy. Um, these are the five A's, and I don't know if uh, Dr. Melke talked about this yesterday, but this is one of the frameworks that we use when we're thinking about media literacy, access, awareness, assessment. These are all tools, right? Assessment, appreciation, and then action, right? And so you're going to be getting a lot of this over the next week. Um, I think particularly within the context of my talk and political economy, uh, awareness is especially important. Right? We need to understand the structures of the media corporations, how news is produced, where news comes from. I'm sure you all know news doesn't exist in a bubble. Right? It's produced by people who work for corporations, for governments. So there are a lot of influences that shape the news that we receive, the news that we consume, what that news is about, who writes that news, what, uh, uh, in what way, how is that news framed. So awareness is important. And then assessment. Right? So how can we as academics and as scholars and as professors and journalists, how can we assess the state of the media and understand it on a deeper level? Um, and so just briefly, because I am an academic, um, it's always important to think about some of the theories. Um, why, do we even, why do we even connect right? Um, democracy, quote unquote, because I know that's, that can be a problematic word as well, with the press, right? What's the, what's the relationship between journalism and politics, and particularly in a Western context and, and a post-Enlightenment liberal context, what's the connection between a free press, a free media, and a democracy? Um, and so I just want to share a couple of scholars with you briefly. Um, one is John Dewey. Um, Dewey was a, an education uh, 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 scholar from the 1920s and 30s, very influential in the United States and globally in his thoughts about the importance of education within a democracy, but also how we communicate, right? And he said that democracy is more than a form of government. It is a, primarily a mode of associated living, of conjoint communicated experience. So that if we are able to communicate with one another clearly and freely without censorship, that uh, the societies that we build will be stronger. Right? We'll understand better what's happening. And in order to have that understanding, we need a press that's free. Um, and you notice I put normative, right? So when we think about uh, press theories, oftentimes they are normative. Meaning that this isn't necessarily what exists, but it's what we hope for, right? So uh, as I talk about all of these things, uh, it's with a clear understanding that I don't know that there's ever been a perfect mod, uh, uh, system of, of journalism in the press, and I don't know that we'll ever have one. But normative tends to indicate that we at least think that it should operate in this way, if what we're hoping for is some sort of liberal democracy, you know, based on personal freedoms and on, and on a society that's open. Um, so Jürgen Habermas, who some of you may have read in your classes, uh, wrote about the, the public sphere. And he said, only in the light of the public sphere, and he's talking about, you know, pre-enlightenment, cafe societies, pubs, places where people would gather and talk prior to any sort of democratic revolution in France or the United States. He said, only uh, the public sphere did that which existed, the structures that existed, right, become revealed. Did everything become visible to all? People were able to communicate and say, well, 
is this system of peonage, right? Uh, uh, this system of very hierarchical rule. Is it fair? Does it make sense? In the discussion among citizens, issues were made topical and took on shape. Again, this idea that the more information we have, hopefully, the stronger our societies become. And Dennis McQuayle, um, another sort of theoretician uh, who's worked on a lot of issues and written very extensively about the connections between democracy and the press, wrote that the existence of some kind of degree of public interest in the operation of the mass media, notice he says some, not everybody sits around and thinks about these things, right? Most people go about their daily lives and hope that the news they're getting is hopefully not too biased and contains some elements of truth. Um, the operation of the mass media has clearly been widely accepted and it has much to do with the rise of democracy and the public sphere in which opinions are formed and expressed by citizens on the basis of common knowledge and widely held values, right? Again, getting back to that idea that, that uh, Habermas was talking about and that John Dewey was talking about is if we are able to op openly and freely communicate with one another as well as with those in positions of power, politicians, etc., that hopefully then we have stronger democracies. And so how does political economy fit within all of this? Well, political economy is one framework. It's a lens, right, for understanding uh, uh, the production of production and trade and their relations with law, custom, and government, as well as with the distribution of income and wealth, right? So it's looking at connections between the political system, how an economy functions, and of course, when we're talking about media, for the most part, we're talking about corporations that produce wealth, that pro but also produce information. Okay, so it's you can look at you can use the political economy to study the production of cars, right, or widgets or oil, right, anything that can be bought, sold, traded, commoditized. But as we also know, media also functions within that market sphere. Okay. And so it becomes a lens to try to understand, well, how do the forces of the political economy shape the media that we consume? And how is it produced? How does it influence that system of production? Okay? So what does that look like within a free market system? Uh, and I'm going to refer to a lot of US examples at this point. Um, when we think about media and media ownership, right? who's producing the media? How is it, what does that environment look like? Um, we can see pretty clearly that within the last 30 to 40 years, the number of media companies in the world, and again, they're US-based companies, but as we know, uh, US media uh, has a cultural stand that goes around the globe, is very influential. Most of you have probably heard of Disney and MTV and Hollywood, right? There's a cultural imperialism there. Um, so it, these, this has implications around the world. We can see that you know, between 1983 and 2004, massive conglomeration, massive concentration within the media, right? Where there used to be quite a few and diverse number of companies producing uh, the content that we consume. Um, there are now just five or six. And so what are, the, what are the implications of ownership, right? Political economy, production, concentration, which we just saw. Um, this means fewer corporations own media outlets. Conglomeration. Um, so media is part of larger business corporations, and I'll show you some examples of this, right? Uh, an example would be Comcast, which is a cable company, by NBC Universal, which is a media company or GE, which is a very large corporation, produces lots of different things, and also uh, produces media content, right? So that's what we mean when we say conglomeration. Um, integration, so this uh, exists in two uh, sort of uh, 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 models. One is horizontal, so when, when one company buys other companies that make the same product, right? When one media company buys another media company, when a movie studio buys another movie studio, okay? That's considered horizontal integration. Um, and this leads to cross promotion, synergy, efficiency, et cetera. And vertical integration, okay? Where we have companies that control sort of the process of production from the bottom to the top, right? And we see this now in cable industries, 
uh, who may uh, produce the content that you consume, but also own the cables that come into your home, and also the internet connection that you have, right? So along that entire process of production, there's, there's control by one media company, or maybe just a few. A very good example of this in the United States used to exist within uh, um, the movie studios, where movie studios would produce the movies, but they would also own the companies that made the film, they would own the theaters that showed the movies, the actors would all work for them, the directors would all work for them, so it was complete vertical integration, right? It was broken up, and sometimes these monopolies are broken up, sometimes not. Um, this is just another graph to give you an idea of some of the companies that are, that are uh, dominant today within the US, and again, I would argue on sort of a global scale. And you can see this is very similar to the graph that I showed before. In 1983, 90% of US was owned by 50 companies, okay? In 2012, 90% of US media is controlled basically by six sort of media giants, right? And you've heard of these companies. Comcast, which bought NBC Universal recently. News Corp, which owns Fox. Disney, I'm sure you've heard of. Viacom, which is MTV, right? Paramount Pictures, et cetera. Time Warner, very large. And then CBS. And I'm going to share examples. Several of these companies, as I talk about how this ownership has been seen to influence what the news looks like within the media companies that they own. But it's not just the United States, okay? A media conglomeration is a global phenomenon. I'll show you a couple of other images. And I don't expect you to read all of this. This is Argentina where they have really heavy Argentina in South America, have heavy media conglomeration, like Barín, they're called, and a lot of different companies, as you can see. And then, interestingly enough, to get back to the global function, you'll see at the top that Goldman Sachs, which is a very large hedge fund and uh, asset management company in the United States, has a direct ownership within Grupo Barín. And this is my favorite. <laughs> This is, this, is, this is media in Europe, okay? Uh, you can see that these are incredibly complex companies, right? And if you happen to be consuming uh, media here, and I can't even read this because it's too pixelated, you can follow this back and see, well, this is under the ownership of Burleson, okay? Or Gazprom, or Lagarde, or Finnevest, right? So you have massive media structures, right? that are horizontally integrated, as well as vertically integrated, okay, and operate on a global scale. So what are some of the consequences? What does it look like? What happens with the media content when we have something that looks sort of like this? Well, and this has been studied widely, and you can read a lot about it. I won't go into a lot of details today in the interest of time, but we have homogenation of media products, right? Uh, reality TV is a great example. A reality show is created in one country, and then that format is distributed all around the world, right? Survivor, The Bachelor, The Bachelorette, right? You can find these products in almost every country in the world now, right? So that's what I mean by homogenization. Concentration of power, and we'll talk more about this, right? But the influence grows, obviously, in these media companies as um, they become more heavily concentrated. Limited access. Right? If you're dealing with a huge uh, media market that's dominated by one or two companies, and you have your own company, and you're hoping to have people watch your content, it's going to be hard. Right? Because there's going to be very limited space for you um, to enter into that field. And we can talk about the internet, and we can talk about ways of, of moving around these corporate structures, but it becomes a very difficult um, environment. Blurring the line between news and business, and I'll, I'll, show, I'll talk about this some examples, but when you have companies that produce products, right, and also own media outlets, and one of those products is hurting a lot of people, how do we cover that? How do journalists who work for that company that produces that product also cover what the damage that that product is causing? Increased bottom line pressure, right? All of these companies are publicly owned, traded on global stock markets, and what do companies who are publicly traded need to do? They need to produce more profit every year. You can't one year say, well, we've actually just made the exact same amount of money as we made last year. Right? Go to your stockholders and tell them that and see what they say. They say, 
go and make some more money, <laughs> right? Go find a way to make more. We don't want the same amount of money, right? So bottom line factor. Business conscious media personnel, right? Uh, the CEOs, the news managers, the people who answer to those who are above them, they're, they're thinking about that, right? And this hasn't always been the case. We can go back 50, 60 years, uh, the news part of large corporations used to be considered that you would operate at a loss. Okay, it's back. Sorry. Sorry, I just worry about the translation. I'm very loud. I don't need it. Um, we keep moving or I'll go too slow. Um, business interest versus public interest, right? So these are, some, these are some of the concerns, right? If you're a political economist who studies media production, you could write lots of each one of these, right? And entire books have been written about each of these concerns, right? If we go back to the do you want me to just switch? It seems to be going in and out. I don't mind using the hand. My clicker's not working anymore. Anyway. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, and so, what I want to do is share with you a few um, um, uh, authors and scholars who've written really widely on these on these concerns, right? And what are these? What do these outcomes mean? within sort of that normative democratic framework that I shared with you, right? How does this fit within our ideas of a public sphere, right? Where we hope that there is an open flow of information. And none of this seems to promote or look like it might lead to an open flow of information, but more of a shaped or perhaps biased or closed system of information. And so this is the concern. So I'm gonna share with you a few books that maybe you want to go and read, or maybe you're familiar with some of the examples that these authors use to talk about what the concerns that they have with political economy and uh, media conglomeration and monopolization, and then show you some examples. Um, so, uh, um, Ben Bagdikian uh, is a media scholar who's been writing about the media monopoly for a long time. Um, uh, this is uh, the Media Monopoly uh, book that he wrote. I think the first issue came back in, uh, out in the 1980s. Uh, the sixth edition came out not long ago, because you can see he's been concerned about this for a long time. And a lot of the arguments that he's been making uh, uh, tend to play out on a sort of depressingly uh, frequent basis. Um, and, and within the most recent version of the book, which is still um, not entirely new, he uses one example that I'll share with you um, about a community in North Dakota, which is a state in the northern United States. And in the early 2000s, there was terrible flooding uh, in North Dakota, as you can see, right? Uh, streets were underwater, homes were lost, um, I believe a few people died. And in a time of crisis, right, a natural disaster, where would we go, right, to, to learn about uh, um, what's open, where can I get supplies, um, can I find shelter somewhere, when will this storm end, right? You would go to your, the news outlets, right, um, to try to understand and make sense of it. Well, in North Dakota, as in many places across the country in the United States, um, Clear Channel, which is a huge radio monopoly, has bought up lots of radio stations. Lots. And in some places, like Minot, North Dakota, they own all the radio stations. There were six. And part of the, the bottom line pressures, you know, at Clear Channel had led to um, syndication, right? Where they take away local journalists, people who live in the community, they're laid off, they're fired. And then there's just a national feed that comes to the station. So basically nobody works at the station anymore. It's just a signal. Okay, it's making sense. And so what happened during this flood was that there were no radio journalists on the air in North Dakota. All there was was a syndicated feed from New York. So you now you start to get, like, you start to understand, like, what are the real implications, right? Like, we can talk about it in a very abstract sense. We can say, oh, well, that looks kind of weird, but I don't really understand it. But when you look at real examples, like this one, then you start to understand, okay, 
well, in sort of an open society where we want a free press and we want media to serve that function of, of, of serving the public sphere, this can be a very real outcome, right? And Clear Channel was criticized pretty heavily for this, okay? So fortunately, there are still structures in place where we can say, hey, this was a, this was a particularly bad outcome, right? Um, and uh, Bagdikian writes, five global dimension firms, again, it's always you know, five or six, operating with many of the characteristics of a cartel, right, if we think about OPEC, for instance, own most of the newspapers, magazines, book publishers, uh, uh, motion picture studios, and radio and television stations in the United States. Each medium they own covers the entire country. The programs broadcast in the six empty stations in Minot, North Dakota, were simultaneously being broadcast in New York City. Right? So this is where uh, academics and theorists like Bagdikian become concerned. And then there's one of my favorite media theorists, um, John Stewart, from The Daily Show. And so uh, I'm going to share with you uh, a clip from John Stewart uh, where he's talking about NBC Universal. Okay. But seemingly each successive worldwide disaster being more and more perilous to cover. Watch this report from NBC's Richard Engel in Libya. This is amazing. He just handed me his gun. I didn't realize until he put it in my hands. It's actually just made of plastic. It's a toy. Three explosions, 50 yards away. designed by General Electric, part owner of NBC Universal. <laughs> Quick disclaimer, Japan's unsolicited poison steam bath is brought to you by the same terrific organization that brings you this broadcast tonight. <laughs> you're welcome. That is awkward. You know, when you're calling someone to report about their role in a global radiation crisis, you kind of want to have to press nine for an outside line. NBC News has to do this a lot. The coffee makers have the potential to overheat. G, of course, is the parent company of NBC Universal. I should mention that that fighter jet engine is built by GE, a part owner of NBC. Hospitals have been getting lots of calls about the scanners, many of them made by GE, parent company of NBC Universal. More than 200 companies, including NBC's parent company, General Electric, have provided jets to politicians. Western Precision also did business with other sources, including taking loans from Wells Fargo and GE Capital, owned by the parent company of NBC. This is the most powerful engine in the world, full disclosure. It's actually made by our parent company, General Electric. GE parent company of NBC Universal makes a whole lot of things, including LED lights, and we should have said so. The accused killer is a successful father of three before his arrest earlier this month. Newman was a manager in Atlanta for GE, the parent company of NBC Universal. You even have to do that for the murder guy? <laughs> After raping the horse, the suspect washed the blood and semen off his clothes. We should inform you that the horse, the blood, the semen, and the stackable washer dryer he used <laughs> are all manufactured by GE, part owner of NBC News. Here's the thing about General Electric. It's a massive conglomerate with fingers in a lot of pies. Uh, media, uh, medical equipment, appliances, light bulbs, oil, real estate, uh, aviation, uh, trains, uh, weapons, weapons production. Weapons and weapons production? Hold on. Let me go back to that footage we saw earlier. Three explosions, 50 yards away. Chuck, give me a quick cutaway of the mortar hole. Son of a bitch! <laughs> Two months ago, only owns 49% of NBC. 
NBC. And I'm not saying that because of GE, NBC can't report objectively on, let's say, anything that has occurred in the world post-industrial revolution. <laughs> but here's my suggestion to NBC. Own it! Admit it, don't just use it. I give you your new Nightly News theme song. Nightly News begins now. And the odds are GE's involved somehow. That's John Stewart's name, and it's funny, right? And at the same time, not. Because here we have a major news outlet that on a pretty consistent basis had to add the caveat that the things they were gonna report on uh, were involved with the company that owned them, right? Now, you can say, well, they're, at least they're being transparent about it, but it does raise a lot of red flags, right? Let me keep moving. Um, this is another uh, important book when it comes to political economy of the media. It's called Manufacturing Consent. Uh, it was written by uh, Edward S. Herman and Noam Chomsky. Uh, Noam Chomsky, many of you have probably heard of. Uh, he, he doesn't get on the air a lot in the United States, <laughs> but he, he, he is often heard outside of the U.S., uh, particularly his views on this region, etc. So they wrote this book. It's incredibly influential, you know, often cited when people are talking about what this means. And they developed what they call the propaganda model of the media, right? And so their goal was to explain performance of U.S. media in terms of institutional structures and relationships, right? What we were just talking about. What's the relation between media and, corpor and media and corporations, media and government, right? And how do we make sense of it? Um, among other uh, functions, sorry, there's a, a, a typo there. Among other functions, the media serve and propagandize on behalf of, right, uh, the powerful societal interests that control and finance them, right? So they, they have a particular view. Whether they own up to it or not, right, media corporations, especially very large ones, tend to represent a sort of elite view of the news landscape. Um, and they have a lot of examples about it in their book. If you haven't read it, I really suggest that you do. Uh, um, it's not uplifting, it can be a little depressing, but their analysis is a um, they, they look at structural factors, right, which we've already been discussing, ownership and control, uh, dependence on funding sources, right, advertising, and uh, we'll talk more about that, uh, relationship between media and those who make the news, right, so they also look at that, right, if you're a journalist, you need access to people who can give you the right sound bites, right, politicians, people who work in the White House, etc., and there's a close relationship that exists there. Right? And we need to understand what that relationship is. What is that access? How do we, how do we make sense of it? Um, and the model describes forces that shape what media do. Right? What do all these forces, how do they play into what we end up reading, watching, listening to, consuming? Right? Not just as consumers, okay, but as citizens. Right? As people who we hope when we go to vote, when we think about who, what policies we think are important, what politicians we think might best serve us, that we go in with a full understanding of the situation, of what's being presented and who this person is. Um, there's been, you know, they have their own examples, but there's been some really excellent examples in the US press in recent times that's been reported on both in mainstream media, like the New York Times, and also in more alternative media outlets like Democracy Now! and Alternet, et cetera. Um, and, and that often have to do with this part of the world, especially since 9-11. Uh, one example was of the Syrian conflict, um, and the experts brought on to talk about the attack, and somebody did a, a study and looked at the major Sunday talk shows, right, which is when uh, uh, people come on the air in the United States on Sundays onto NBC, CBS, uh, ABC, and talk about the important issues. And they did, they did a, a survey and they looked at the coverage and they found that they had 89 experts on during a particular important moment in the Syrian crisis when um, Bashar al-Assad, there was the accusations that uh, chemical weapons had been used and was the United States going to invade? This was the uh, quote unquote red line that had been created by Barack Obama where he said, well, if, if this happens, we will do this, right? It didn't happen, but there was a lot of talk. So of 89 of them, only one said, maybe this isn't a good idea, right? Now, if you're a news outlet, there are a lot of people who didn't think it was a good idea. This doesn't look like what we would think of as like fairly uh, uh, unbiased sort of coverage, right? But again, under the propaganda model, right? Who has the access, right? Who's asked to come on Sunday programs? What point of view do they present, 
and there's something opposite of that view presented. And then there's an economy function, right? So they also looked at um, who these experts were, right? Usually former military officials, right? Generals, colonels, people who work in defense industries, okay? And then we see that a lot of those folks actually sit on the boards of major uh, weapons manufacturers, like Raytheon, like Northrop Grumman, right? So there's a real, there's a real conflict there. Right? If I have stock in a company that makes the weapons that are going to be used uh, if we go to war with Syria, that company is going to make a lot of money. And then I go on the news and I say, uh, it's a good idea. We, this is important. We should go to war. And the journalists don't uh, uh, um, reveal that conflict of interest, which very seldom happened. I think in one of these cases, it was mentioned that this person sits on the board of, let's say, Raytheon, then there's an issue, right? That's what they mean of the, the sort of the propaganda model of the political economy of the news. Um, another sort of famous incident was the Iraq War, CNN and the generals, um, and um, David Barstow from the New York Times, and again, not all media are bad, that's not my point, uh, he won a Pulitzer Prize for this reporting, where he looked at this idea that in the run-up to the Iraq War, um, there were lots of paid commentators on the cable network, CNN in particular, who had a vested interest in the idea that we would go to war. And yet those connections and, and those conflicts of interest were very seldomly revealed. Okay? And what they were used is that the Pentagon, which is the major um, defense function, the Department of Defense right, in the United States, uh, uh, had their group of generals and they said, here are, these are the talking points, right? We need you to go on the air and make this argument. And CNN, very willingly, right, brought them in to make the case. And we all know, you know, what the result of that case that was made. We still see that now. Um, another example, this gentleman in the middle, General Jack King, uh, always on the air, always talking about the importance and why we should go to war, a real hawkish figure. Um, somebody looked at, at him in particular. They found that um, uh, he made nine appearances on Fox, right, in the late summer of 2014. Again, a time when the conflict with Syria was looking like the United States may get involved in a military sense. Um, he's a special advisor to Academy, uh, which is the contractor formerly known as Blackwater, made billions of dollars in the war in Iraq, a board member to tank an aircraft manufacturer, General Dynamics a venture partner to SCP Partners, investment partner that um, works with defense contractors. Um, in 2013, General Dynamics paid him uh, a quarter million dollars, right? And you can look at, <laughs> interestingly, uh, some of these defense contractors when um, uh, these guys would go on the air and when President Obama would talk about uh, the, the idea that we might go to war with Syria, you could look at their stock price. Right? You can look at that stock price and it just starts to go like this. Right? So now we see like a real circular connection here between what we see on the news, what the economic influences are, what the political influences are, and then of course the very real global outcomes that exist, which is war. Right? And so we have to think about this very carefully in terms of what all of that means. Uh, one more theorist that you should be aware of, who writes a lot about political economy in the media, Robert McChesney. He wrote this in 2000. He's been writing about this issue for a long time. Uh, rich media, poor democracy, communication, politics, and what he refers to as dubious times, which I think we're still living in. And he writes, the media have become a significant anti-democratic force, right? So he actually thinks that rather than supporting and propping up democracy, in his eyes, right, they actually work to undermine it, okay? Uh, in the United States and to varying degrees worldwide. The wealthier and more powerful media giants have become the poorer the prospects for participatory democracy, right? This idea that we, we learn about the information in the media, we take that with us when we go to vote, which politicians we choose to support, the policies that we think are important for our country, what we want our society to look like. The idea is that we all participate, right? Um, uh, this concentration accentuates the core tendencies of a profit-driven, advertising-supported media system, right? Uh, Hyper-commercialism and denigration of journalism and public service. It is a poison pill for democracy. It's pretty strong language, right? But I think the folks who write about this and feel passionately about it, um, it's not hard for them to find examples, right? So it isn't that they're just off in a corner 
talking to themselves, being very worried, right? It's that they look around them and they say, well, look at the, look at the examples I just shared with you, right? Um, we have to question that. We have to dig deeper within that and say, well, what are the outcomes of that? What are the problems with this idea that we would bring all of these military sort of hawkish figures onto the air without questioning their connections to major defense contractors and the global sort of military industrial complex, right? Um, what does that mean in a democracy if those connections aren't clear? If the case is being made that we should go to war in Iraq, are we getting all the information we need to make that decision? Right? As Americans in this case. Right? And we weren't getting all the information. So this idea of, of um, particularly hyper-commercialism right, and advertising supported media brings me back to uh, Edward R. Murrow. Now, Edward R. Murrow was a, a, a foreign correspondent in World War II okay, uh, on the radio. And he's kind of like one of the grandfathers of, of American media, highly venerated. right. Uh, um, supremely ethical in his view of what he thought at the time. And, and now I worry we're so cynical that this idea of, of objective journalism just seems like a dream, right? How could it be possible? But he was one of these guys that really believed it, right? And, and he did a lot of great reporting. Um, and at one point, they learned about uh, um, some uh, issues to do with sort of the Red Scare in the United States, which if you know about it, there was sort of a communist witch hunt in the 1950s in the United States during the height of the Cold War where there was a senator named Joe McCarthy and he was just rounding people up. Anybody who seemed like they might be left, right, to the left, uh, um, was uh, accused of being a communist and either arrested or blacklisted. It happened in Hollywood, it happened in Washington, it happened in New York. And Edward R. Murrow, who worked for CBS, um, discovered a really important story and I won't go into all the details, but in the end, what happened is that uh, CBS asked him not to air the story. Told him that we can't have you airing this because there were concerns from the advertisers, right? And, and, and back then, uh, a lot of news programs had like a single advertising source, right? So it would be the Edward R. Murrow, right? His talk show was brought to you by this cigarette maker or this oil company, right? That one company could raise the concern that look, Americans are worried about communism. We don't want to go against Joe McCarthy because he'll ruin us, right? This very powerful senator. And so we want you to not air this story, which was true, which had been vetted, which had all the facts, right? And for Edward R. Murrow and Fred Friendly, who went on to uh, create CBS's 60 Minutes, this was, this was almost the greatest insult that you could have, right? Here was a guy who was in World War II, uh, covered the biggest events uh, uh, in the world at the time, and here he was being told. So when he was being honored one time at this radio and television news director of associations, um, he gave this speech. And so this is not him, this is an actor speaking in a movie from 2005 called Good Night, Good Luck. But it's based on that story of Edward R. Murrow and his fight with CBS. So here's what he had to say. Yeah. Do nobody any good. good. This might just do nobody any good. At the end of this discourse, a few people may accuse this reporter of fouling his own comfortable nest, and your organization may be accused of having given hospitality to heretical and even dangerous ideas. But the elaborate structure of networks, advertising agencies, and sponsors will not be shaken or altered. It is my desire, if not my duty, to try to talk to you journeymen with some candor about what is happening to radio and television. And if what I say is responsible, I alone am responsible for the saying of it. Our history will be what we make of it. And if there are any historians about 50 or 100 years from now, and there should be preserved the kinescopes of one week of all three networks, they will there find, recorded in black and white and in color, Evidence of decadence, escapism, and insulation from the realities of the world in which we live. We are currently wealthy, fat, comfortable, and complacent. We have a built-in allergy to unpleasant or disturbing information. Our mass media reflect this. But unless we get up off our fat surpluses and recognize that television in the main is being used to distract, delude, amuse, and insulate us, 
than television and those who finance it, those who look at it, and those who work at it. I see a totally different picture too late. I began by saying that our history will be what we make it. If we go on as we are, then history will take its revenge and retribution will not limp in catching up with us. Just once in a while, let us exalt the importance of ideas and information. Let us dream to the extent of saying that on a given Sunday night, the time normally occupied by Ed Sullivan is given over to a clinical survey on the state of American education. And a week or two later, the time normally used by Steve Allen is devoted to a thoroughgoing study of American policy in the Middle East. Would the corporate image of their respective sponsors be damaged? Would the shareholders rise up in their wrath and complain? Would anything happen other than a few million people would have received a little illumination on subjects that may well determine the future of this country and therefore the future of the corporations? To those who say people wouldn't look, they wouldn't be interested, they're too complacent, indifferent, and insulated, I can only reply, there is, in one reporter's opinion, considerable evidence against that contention. But even if they are right, what have they got to lose? Because if they are right, and this instrument is good for nothing but to entertain, amuse, and insulate, then the tube is flickering now, and we will soon see that the whole struggle is lost. This instrument can teach. It can illuminate, and yes, it can even inspire. But it can do so only to the extent that humans are determined to use it towards those ends. Otherwise, it is merely wires and lights in a box. Good night and good luck. Okay, so um, that was an actor, but that was the speech that he gave, right? Where he really was concerned that uh, if TV was going to live up to its sort of full democratic promise, promise, not just to entertain, but to inform, to enlighten, to illuminate, to bring ideas forward into the public sphere, then we have to be very careful about how it's controlled, who controls it, right? And, and, and his point, I think, is very good. He says, we can't assume that people don't want information. We do want information. Don't assume that we only want to be entertained. And yet, uh, that was his very, very real concern. And, um, and the things that he said then, you know, unfortunately in many ways, um, and not always exactly as he pointed them out, um, have in many instances uh, come to pass. There's a, there's a second movie I would encourage you to see if you have time. It's called The Insider. It won a lot of Oscars when it came out. Um, it has Al Pacino and Russell Crowe, but it's based on a true story about a CBS 60 Minutes reporter named Lowell Bergman who uh, uh, had a whistleblower from tobacco come to him, the big tobacco industries, came to him and said, um, they've been lying about what they put in cigarettes for a long time, and I have the evidence to prove it, okay? Huge story, right? And, and big tobacco, as it was called at the time, was very good. They've been telling people that cigarettes were not bad for you for decades, right? And they had all the science to prove it. And here was a very high-level whistleblower blower, who came forward uh, and said, I, I can tell you uh, for certain that they've been lying, and then indeed cigarettes this sounds silly now, right, are very bad for you, right? And so what happened? Um, they nearly killed the program. CBS, again, uh, nearly killed the program because they were about to go through a major merger. Um, they were um, about to make a lot of money as they were bought up by another corporation. And there were real concerns that this story, if it exploded on them, might hurt that, right? To their credit, they did air it in the end, but not without a huge fight. And Lowell Bergman, was sort of played the role of Edward R. Murrow, right? He said, no way, no way am I gonna compromise my journalistic values. This is one of the biggest stories of our time. Uh, and, and the movie's fantastic, it's very grippy. But it does show you, when you go up against a corporation as big as Big Tobacco, those big companies, they come at them with everything they have, right? Everything they can do to shut this story down, including putting pressure on CBS. And now, <laughs> We, you knew we were going to talk about this guy, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, we, we are currently going through one of the oddest uh, presidential elections in uh, U.S. history, and, and we have, I, I heard Donald Trump the other day refer to as the first media president, right? Um, not because he's a really great businessman, because we know he's not, right? Um, but because most Americans 
know who Donald Trump is because of this, right? Not because he's ever held public office, which he hasn't. Not because he has a particularly good track record of ever doing anything very successful. Usually he loses money on the things that he does. He's not a nice person, right? And yet, right, in a system that values entertainment over information, somebody like Donald Trump is perfectly viable, right? He has the name recognition, and he's been very good at doing that. One of his best allies is Fox News, right? Um, and, and his ability to use Fox News as basically his own sort of um, personal platform for the things he wants to say, even when he fights with them, right? Even when they tell him, well, maybe we won't cover you, maybe uh, the things you are saying are too extreme, he pushes back. And Fox News was uh, created by Roger Ailes, who used to work for Richard Nixon, right? And, and was Richard Nixon's sort of PR and press guy, and, and said at one point, in 1968, Roger Ailes boasted to a reporter that television would one day replace the political party as the most powerful force in American politics, right? And he wasn't wrong. It is one of the most powerful forces in American politics, okay? And Donald Trump has been very good uh, at, at understanding that system, right? Say what you will about him, he's been pretty good at using the system that we've created to his own uh, benefit. To the point where, um, this is a tweet, at one point they had a little fight, Fox wasn't sure that they wanted Trump on the air anymore, he told them if that was the case, he wasn't gonna be on Fox anymore, which would be terrible for ratings, right? For the people watching and tuning in. I mean, people like to see what Donald Trump is gonna say, and so when they finally agreed to his demand, he tweeted out, Roger Ailes just called, he's a great guy, and assures me that Trump, quote unquote, I, he refers to himself as sort of a brand, right? Trump uh, will be treated fairly on at Fox News. His word is always good, okay? 1,500 retweets, 3,000 favorites. So, so he's been good in that sense, but he hasn't just been good for Fox, right? Um, uh, just um, in February, there was a leaked conference call, okay, from the CEO of CBS, Leslie Moonves, and uh, um, he was talking to shareholders, right, people who own stock, right, in the company that owns CBS, and basically said, uh, uh, it may not be good for America, but it's damn good for CBS, okay? All the ratings are high, right? CNN's having one of the best years on, on, on uh, record, and I actually have uh, the audio, from that conference call, it's only about 40 seconds, but it's worth hearing. And again, Les Moonves, right, the CEO of CBS, didn't know this was gonna get out, right? Here's one of the beautiful things about the internet, right? He didn't know this audio was going public. He was talking to shareholders. He was saying, hey, look, we may be going to hell in a handbasket, but you guys are gonna make some money this year, okay? CBS is doing good, and thank God for Donald Trump. Um, so this is, this is what, um, this was the call. Again, I, I warned you, right? This is not, it's a little depressing. But it's okay, it's good to understand these things. Uh-oh, it just got filtered. Huh, well, it was working last night. I apologize, that's okay. I told you what he said. So this is another example, right? Um, the New York Times did an analysis and saw and found that and Donald Trump has received two billion dollars of free, basically free media advertising, right? Because every time he goes on the air, everybody covers it. He doesn't pay anything for that, right? All he has to do is say he's going to have a news conference, and everybody shows up. Two billion dollars, right? And they just did that estimating. Well, if we look at the amount of airtime that he's had, we add up all those minutes, right? What would it have cost him? if he had paid for that as an advertisement, right? As a political advertisement versus what he got by just going on, right? And as you've probably heard, when he goes on the air, oftentimes he's really not questioned, right? If he gets on, he says the thing he wants to say, and he goes about his day. Now, things have started to change. People are fact-checking the things that he says because usually they aren't true, but it's been working and incredibly effectively. This is a graph. Um, that shows bot versus free media, okay? So uh, Donald Trump spent 
and when this graph came out, and this was a couple months ago, had at that point spent about $10 million in advertising, and you look at his free media coverage, right? Way out ahead of everybody else, okay? Um, if you break that down into how much he spent per vote, right? Like, how much money has he spent on each person that's voted for him, right? If we, have, if we put advertising to vote, because that's what political advertisements are for, right? I pay for the money, and then hopefully, in exchange for that, I get you to vote for me. $2 a vote versus $5 for Kasich, Christie for, right? And so we start to see now, he had a lot more people vote for him, obviously, he won the primary, right? But what he had to spend for that, incredibly low. And it's amazing. This was, this was just one, one instance, right? Where he was going to speak. He was not yet speaking. They weren't quite sure when it was gonna start. And they kept the cameras on this podium for I think nearly an hour waiting for him to come, just saying, about to speak, stand by. At the same time that this was happening, Bernie Sanders, who was on the other side, right, the sort of progressive candidate in the United States who was uh, uh, beat by Hillary Clinton but ran a very effective campaign, lots of small donors, etc. Bernie Sanders was giving a major speech about policy at the same time as an empty podium was waiting for Donald Trump. Nobody covered it, right? Because there probably wouldn't be as good of ratings on a Bernie, boring Bernie Sanders speech. You don't know what Trump's going to say. He might see something crazy, right? He probably will. The New York Times is just as guilty. Um, this is just from uh, August 4th, so just last week. Um, this was the front page of their website. Trump. Trump. Let's see. Trump. 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 And then you think, oh, well, maybe, maybe not. Maybe there's one story that's not about Trump, but <laughs> not the case, right? Uh, pretty amazing, right? Here, this is the gray lady, right? This is, the, this, is the, the, this is what we rely on in the United States when we think of as sort of the standard bearer for uh, uh, intelligent, uh, unbiased news coverage. And they, I would argue, are just as guilty as anyone else, right? And this is a great example. You can check their homepage right now. I looked this morning. I think five of the seven stories were somehow Trump-related. It's click, right? You put him, you put him on there, and somebody's going to click it. Um, then there's social media, of course, right? This is the other brilliance of Donald Trump's strategy, okay? Uh, 10.7 million followers, all right? Um, um, and I, th this was just, I grabbed this yesterday, uh, and that's his running mate, Pence, and he had just recently tweeted this out. I'm not just running against crooked Hillary, that's what he calls her, crooked Hillary Clinton. I am running against a very dishonest and totally biased media, but I will win. So I love, I love it. The media are helping Donald Trump essentially win everything that he's trying to do, and he still hates them. <laughs> right? It's an amazing relationship, and, and really so uh, appropriate to the day and age in which we're living. Right? Because that's what he tells his supporters, the media hate me. But, but I think he knows, and his supporters know, it doesn't matter if they hate or love him. The fact is that they cover him. Right? And the reason that they'll cover him is because he generates a lot of revenue. Right? And he's a news figure, right? Let's not lose track of that. When he says stuff, it is newsworthy, but there's a really, there's a circular logic there, right? Between what he says and how it gets covered, and then what he says again and how that gets covered, okay? So, so those are just a few examples, and I realize that it seems awfully oppressive, but um, again, uh, um, it's not the entire picture. We're gonna hear a lot more, but it's important to understand it, right? And so I wanna transition just briefly for a little while um, into what I understand um, in speaking with Jad and in studying sort of the region, what, what there is to be said about sort of the Arab media system, right? Because I'm sure you all know there's heavy conglomeration and heavy concentration in this part of the world as well, right? There are a few very dominant um, regional networks Right? that have bought up lots of different outlets and have a real influence, okay? And so just as one small example, we can think about sort of the Arab, and I realize it's a very broad term, but Arab media and what was referred to at the time as the Arab Spring, and you know I put it in quotes because obviously that, um, there was much different outcomes than many people thought at the beginning. Um, but, but one interesting sort of element in that was the role of Al Jazeera, and I'll, I'll, I'll share that in a second, but this was written by Ali Hashim in The Guardian in 2012 about sort of how Arab media were functioning within the sort of 
political and democratic uprisings that were happening at the time, right? And he said, today, Arab media is divided. Media uh, outlets have become like parties. Politics dominates the business on both sides of the landscape, and people can't really depend on one channel to get their full news digest. I mean, it sounds very much like the United States. Right? The problem isn't who is telling lies and who is accurate. Media organizations are giving the part of the story right, that serves the agenda of their financier, so it's clear that only part of the truth is exposed while the other part is buried. The elite are once again dealing with the Arab news channels the way they used to do with Arab state media. Right? Most uh, media networks in this part of the world used to be controlled and run by the state. That's changed over the recent decades, but now we have a similar system. And so uh, one example that was used a lot at the time by sort of media critics was uh, Al Jazeera and the coverage of the Bahrain uprising. Right? So in Egypt, we know uh, Al Jazeera was very proactive uh, in sort of getting that story out, uh, and in Tunisia, and in Libya, and sort of supporting the sort of democratic processes that were happening, the, the peaceful uprisings that were taking place, right? To the point of probably being biased on, to one side, right? And yet at the same time, um, there was a very large uprising happening in Bahrain. People were in the streets, there was an occupation, and there was almost zero coverage on Al Jazeera. Now what? Well, as all of you know, Al Jazeera is based in Qatar and um, has very close ties with their next door neighbor. And so there was a lot of criticism that there was a top-down pressure there within that network, right, to cover the other uprisings in one way and to cover the Bahraini uprising in another, right? And so we start to see, like, what are the influences? What are the institutional and structural influences that shape coverage, even in a channel that a lot of people were praising? Right, as really helping to sort of inspire and bring this news about this uh, democratic revolution, right, that was sort of gripping Egypt and other places uh, throughout the Middle East. Uh, Aaron Baker, writing in Time, wrote that over the past, she wrote a story about this, over the past three months, the Bahraini authorities have embarked upon a devastating campaign of repression, intimidation, and torture. Sorry, there's a typo. Yet the coverage on Al Jazeera uh, has been largely limited to brief mentions and a backstage examination of why the world's media has been so slow to cover the events there. Okay? So one example, and I'll share another one with you in a second, but just to go through some of the conglomeration and some of the major corporations that exist in this part of the world, uh, we have Rothana, um, huge in terms of music and radio, 12 TV stations, 9 radio stations, advertising agencies, movie productions. Um, their stations play mostly Rotana artists, right? Because um, they have the largest Arab record label with 100 plus artists. Uh, uh, movie productions, which dominate 40% of local markets. Uh, Arab ventures, international ventures, including uh, uh, production agreements with Fox, which is owned by News Corp, right? Um, and so who owns Rotana? Um, well, um, a couple of important figures. Uh, News Corporation owns about 20% of Rotana. And uh, Kingdom Holdings, which is uh, Saudi, uh, uh, controlled by Wadid bin Talal, owns 7% of News Corp, right? Uh, and so 7% of a company like uh, uh, News Corp, which is a multi, multi-billion dollar corporation, that's, you have a pretty big say, right? You're a pretty big stakeholder within that company at the time. Um, Middle East Broadcasting Center, again, um, Saudi interests, 13 plus TV channels, two radio channels, uh, production companies, video on demand, started with direct investments from King Fad. Uh, Orbit Showtime Network, OSN, uh, used to be Orbit and Showtime, and then were uh, combined. Uh, um, the owner, uh, Mamari Holding, uh, 154 television channels, uh, access to Arab and Western media via satellite, um, Marawi Holdings has lots of other interests, right? So kind of like General Electric, banking, perfumes, cosmetics, telecommunications, satellite, restaurants, radio network, right? So that there we're talking about like horizontal, horizontal uh, integration, right? We have one company that has sort of a lot of interests, okay? Um, uh, Arab Radio and Television Entertainment Network, again, Walid bin Talal, and a business partner who's also Saudi, numerous stations. So, you know, as we look at it, we see like Saudi Arabia, right, is, has a major influence within the Middle East when it comes to broadcasting and, and production, okay? And so what are some of the outcomes, right? What does that look like? I mentioned the Al Jazeera case, right? So um, not long ago, um, some of you have probably heard of WikiLeaks. Um, they they um, were able to get a bunch of cables from Saudi Arabia. 
okay? Uh, internal communications within the government, right? Different issues that they were interested in, not just related to media. And, but one of, one of the issues that came out was a very clear uh, connection between um, those interests, right? Business interests and their interest in the news that's produced in countries, not just in Saudi Arabia, but around the country. And one example was a cable that came out showing that a very influential Egyptian talk host had somebody from the Saudi opposition who came on to talk about you know, uh, um, the opposition within the government. And the cable was produced right away saying, we have to fix this. Um, they could not have him on the air anymore. Let's make sure this doesn't happen again. And it didn't happen again. Okay, so similar kinds of conflicts that exist. Um, and then we see also major conglomeration within mobile and ISP, um, oligopolies and internet media, um, large companies combining together um, to create sort of monopolies within uh, internet access and who, who has control of both mobile and ISP. Okay, and we see that in the United States as well. <clears throat> so that brings me to the last part, and I know I'm going on for a long time, um, which is, so how do we, this is you know, the visual representation of the internet, and all that it represents, right? All the connections, why this system looks so different from the top-down hierarchical system that existed in broadcasting, right? Where it, you can go around, and WikiLeaks, WikiLeaks is a great example, right? There are ways now to go around these sort of dominant forces that are corporate or political. Um, and a lot of people are writing about this, right? And what does it mean? Um, Douglas Rushkoff, who's another theorist that I like, talked about the new nationalism of Brexit and Trump as a product of the digital age. Uh, uh, Robert McChesney has been writing about um, what, all of, what the political economy means within the digital era, right? And he writes that the political economy should be the organizing principle for analyzing the digital revolution. The profit motive, commercialism, public relations, marketing, advertising, all defining features of contemporary corporate capitalism are foundational to any assessment of how the internet has developed and is likely to develop. Any attempt uh, to make sense of democracy divorced from capitalism is dubious, right? So just because we think of the internet as being open and free to anyone, he worries that that, that view of it, right, might blind us to some of the influences that are now shaping how the internet works. Okay. Um, one concern that's been brought up uh, a lot recently is this idea of net neutrality, right? Where the internet, when it, in its early days, what was beautiful about it, right, is that everybody's information went at the same speed, right? Whether it was a Fox News media story or my grandmother's blog about her cooking, right? Everybody was able to get their information out there. Now, whether it reached uh, lots of viewers or not depended on whether it was a good blog. Right? Um, but now there's a lot of concern that uh, the companies who sort of own and build the internet would like to create a faster a lane for some folks, right? So that if you're willing to pay a little bit extra, your content will go more quickly across the tubes that make up the internet, and then everybody else will be stuck over there on the side, right? And it's been fun. A lot of people are fighting this. A lot of people are worrying about this because this would really change how the internet works. Right? Um, and the, the, you know, here the joke is for the big companies and their big trucks, they're like, that's great, we'll pay the extra. We don't mind, give us the fast lane. And everybody else will just have to kind of deal with, well, you know, you want video streaming, it's gonna cost you more. You want these websites, it'll cost you more, right? And so uh, this sounds kind of weird, but what does it look like? Well, there was an example that came out um, uh, about a year and a half ago where um, Comcast, uh, wanted Netflix, right, which is a streaming site. It takes a lot of bandwidth, right, especially if you're talking about um, HD. It takes a lot of bandwidth, and Comcast said, look, your customers use a lot of our infrastructure, right? Um, we'd like you to pay more for that access, right, and we'll give you more uh, access to the fast networks, and, and, and Netflix, to their credit, said, no, we're not gonna pay you more, right? We are paying you, and our, 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 that shouldn't impact how quickly uh, our product is, um, reaches our customers. And so that was, that was around here, okay? These are, these are average speeds, all right, of, of Netflix customers, right? People watching Netflix on Comcast. This was when they said no, okay? So suddenly we saw like a really sharp decline in average speeds for Netflix users who had Comcast. And then finally, Netflix agreed that they would follow and pay some extra, and then we see that things started to improve, right? So we had sort of basically an extortion racket, right? Where Comcast said, look, pay us more, and there's a great John Oliver clip, if you haven't seen it, search John Oliver net neutrality, 
and he lays it all out, and it's hilarious, okay? He compared them to the mafia, right? Either you pay us, or you're not gonna get access, right? And they pay. Um, so that's traffic, right? Okay, that's just what goes across the internet, right? How fast does it get there? Uh, who gets it, etc. cetera? What, what about content, right? <coughs> what do we really read, like when we're on Facebook? And a lot of studies show that something like 70% of millennials get their news from Facebook, right, and social media. Okay, so what, why? What do we really read? And why do we read some stories instead of others on Facebook? And there's a lot of issues around this, okay? As these companies have tried to get more involved in not only sort of what comes across our feed, but how it gets to us and how we read it. This was a great post um, called Theft Lies in Facebook Video. And it was by a, a YouTuber, right? Like somebody who actually makes money producing content for YouTube, right? He has about 30 people that work for him. And he was just calling Facebook out because Facebook recently, in the last two years or so, started embedding having native video, right? It used to be you just put a, a YouTube into Facebook and then it would sit there and embed. And increasingly they've been saying, hey, why don't you put your video on Facebook, right, so you don't leave YouTube? And what he found is that um, native stories on Facebook video got way more clicks, right, um, than if you had to then move out. They counted clicks much differently, so all you had to do was click on the video rather than actually watch it for them to say, oh, it was watched, right? And he found that uh, of, the, um, of the most popular videos on Facebook, right, that generated something like 17 billion views in one year, uh, um, 15 of those were taken from other sites and then re-embedded on Facebook, right? So there's a real battle right now about not just getting people to join Facebook, but then what do they consume when they're there? And it's a big issue. Um, this is from The All, which I would also recommend if you're interested in sort of alternative media analysis, um, uh, uh, where the one guy wrote about the internet, the next internet is TV. And he's talking about content that's published, journalism particularly, that's published directly to Facebook, right? And what does that mean for journalists? And he wrote, as more content is, content is published directly onto Facebook, um, uh, uh, users will gradually lose a sense of who's producing what, right? Where's the story coming from? What's the media outlet, right? Really important, like, media literacy uh, questions, right? Who's, who's sending me this? And not only that, how did it end up in my news feed, right? Ask Facebook what their algorithm looks like. Ask Google what their algorithm looks like for how they decide what ends up in your newsfeed. You know what they're gonna tell you? Nothing. It's very proprietary. They don't want people to know, right? Because that's their business model. If they share that, then other people will use it, right? So he says, um, the most consequential journalism becomes just another unit of content in a single stream of music videos, movie trailers, updates from friends and relatives, advertisements, and viral tidbits from sites adept at gaming fast-changing algorithms and behaviors. Readerships that seem large now will turn out to be as ephemeral as Snapchat, right? So what's the point that he's making? The journalism that we find consequential, that wins prizes, that changes systems, right? Oftentimes it's connected to a platform like the New York Times or the Washington Post or the Guardian, right? And we go to their sites and we buy their papers to read from their journalists. And his concern is when those stories are just part of the feed, how do we know what's important, right? How do we understand which of those stories is really consequential in terms of the public sphere, right? And the democratic elements that we expect out of uh, our system. Just a couple more slides. Sorry, um, one other, cash and anxiety on the weird new internet, right? So now another reporter for the all. Look at the stories that are read. Who's really popular on Facebook, okay? Um, so they looked at this, first of all. These are Facebook shares, right? September's, this is from last year, uh, uh, no, 2014. September's most shared sites. Huffington Post, okay, so these uh, had almost 10 million stories shared on Facebook, okay. Play Buzz, not sure what that is. Uh, Buzzfeed, which you've probably heard of, right? Fox News, NBC News, The Guardian, BBC, The New York Times, Mail Online, um, IJR, Independent Journal Review. Okay. Well, out of these, right, most of them are media outlets that we've heard of, right? So, okay, people are sharing news, right? They're sharing news from outlets that produce journalism, that may be biased, maybe not, but it is journalism. Another one, uh, most shared Facebook publishers, Huffington Post, BuzzFeed, Fox News, NBC, uh, IJR, New York Times, Upworthy, PlayBuzz, 
etc. But then he said, okay, but what stories are being read? Okay, not just what publishers, what stories are actually being read, right? Who, what are, what's being shared? And he came up with this list, one through 10. One is from Playbuzz, Latin Times, Playbuzz, 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 Empire News, Playbuzz, Elite Daily, Playbuzz. How good is your memory? Science is fine, drinking wine is better than going to the gym. At what age will you die? Which badass woman were you in your past life? What is your subconscious obsessed with? Uh, and so they said, well, here's what these things are. One is a quiz, two is a thing that is basically false, but a site owned by IBT Media that hosts stories with headlines like 10 Latinas who definitely had plastic surgery. Um, quiz, 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 right? These are all just go and answer. A death hoax from a site that is comprised entirely of fake stories. Quiz, elite daily, sad quiz, okay? So he's just saying, look, uh, it's one thing to talk about publishers, but what are we actually clicking on? What are we reading, right? And this is important. And then finally, um, Facebook as a new gatekeeper, right? Where if you've heard, Facebook has now um, created what they call instant articles, right? So one of the things that Facebook was worried about was that places like the New York Times, they would only get part of the story, and then you click on it, and you, what happens, right? You leave Facebook. They don't want you to leave, right? You need to stay. And so they said, hey, if you sign up for instant articles, New York Times, Washington Post, et cetera, your story will live on Facebook. They won't have to leave. And as a result, we'll make sure that more people see it. It's kind of like the Comcast Netflix thing, right? If you want people to read your stories on our site, here's the system that we want you to be a part of, okay? And most outlets said, okay, what are you gonna say? Right? If 70% of young people are getting their news from social media, you're not gonna say no. And so they did. And so um, in the second quarter of 2014, Facebook drove 20% of traffic to news sites, which is pretty incredible. Um, how? Nobody knows, right? <laughs> they don't say. Google and Facebook together take 52% of all digital advertising. That's for the whole web. All of it, okay? Um, in the first quarter of 2015, and now we're talking about old media, New York Times earned 14 million a month in ad revenue. Uh, 15 years ago, the Times was averaging more than 100 million a month in ad revenue. So all of that growth has really hurt them, right? In a pretty big way. Um, and publishers are giving up their own channels to become suppliers of content, right? There is no New York Times, there are just New York Times articles, right? So like, the platform no longer matters, what matters is where it shows up. And in Facebook's mind, it needs to be only within Facebook. Okay, so uh, the point being that uh, um, the, the models we saw in legacy media, um, unfortunately, a lot of those are being recreated in digital media, and it's almost harder to follow because there's so many sort of opaque algorithms that are involved, okay? So this is my final slide. Try to put it all in context. And this comes back to my very first point, right? So the political economy approach to news production is not an attempt to uncover a conspiracy. That wasn't my point. I don't think there's some cabal out there that sits in a room and says, here's how the world will be run, right? The world's too messy, it's too complicated, right? There's too much going on. I always think the problem with conspiracy theories is you're giving too much credit to people who do a lot of stupid things all the time, right? Um, but, right, it is a way of uh, um, looking at the outcomes Right, of a model of news production, right? That's what this is, it's a model, profit-based, operating with a system of institutional structures and pressures, okay? Whether they're corporate, whether they're political, whether they're cultural, right? It, like I said before, news doesn't exist in a vacuum. We have to understand how it's created and how it's produced so that we can be smarter as consumers and hopefully also as journalists, right? Understanding the forces shaping news production are key to awareness and assessment, as I, as I said at the outset. And these are skills are a core function of media literacy education, right? So not only do journalists need to understand these systems, but uh, faculty and professors and communication programs need to teach these things. Again, not so that people will sit around and say, well, never mind, it doesn't matter, but so that we can somehow create alternatives, right? And finally, I will just say that healthy skepticism is a much more powerful tool than detached cynicism, right? Skepticism motivates us, right? Being healthily skeptical motivates us to want to push back a little bit, to say, yeah, that's one example, that's one version, but I know there are others, right? 
Whereas if you become detached and cynical, you may just go home, crawl under your blanket, and go to bed. <laughs> oh, never mind, right? Um, so that, that's what I have to share with you today. And again, I know it was a little bit dark, but there are alternatives, and I'm so happy that uh, Henry and Sangeet are gonna follow me because I think what they're gonna share with you will really provide some alternative vision. And also, the last thing I would say is um, I will be sharing these slides with uh, Dr. Jad, and it has a bibliography. Um, so if you wanna look at some of these books, read some of these articles, um, you're more than welcome. Thank you for your time. I'm sorry for going on for so long. The other mic. شكراً على المحاضرة القيمة. عندي مداخلة صغيرة هي إنه حسب ما فهمنا من المحاضرة بأنه وسائل الإعلام تتأثر بالسياسة الاقتصادية إذا تتلاعب في المحتوى الإعلامي. وبما أنها تتلاعب في المحتوى الإعلامي هل تظن تلك المؤسسات الإعلامية بأن الجمهور أو المواطنين بين قوسين غير واعين لما ينشر في الوسائل الإعلامية No, I think a lot of people are. They do. Um, maybe not enough, because I often think that um, uh, that unless you're really taking the time to pay attention, these things are hard to follow. You know, they they seem very complicated, and um, that maybe there's not. Maybe it doesn't really matter. I think that's often like there's. It's not that people don't care, but I think there is apathy, right? Um, where they think, well, but it's not, doesn't really matter. They, you know, I go about my life and I do the things that I want to do. Um, and I, but I, I do find as soon as you start to put it all together, as I've tried to do today, uh, people are not surprised. They do understand it. But I think it's important that we, especially as educators, um, create um, uh, uh, spaces where we can talk about it, right? Where we can um, engage in sort of why we think this is a problem or not. Right? Um, and so, no, I, I, I worry that not enough people are aware. Um, and at the same time, we all have our own individual agency, right? We choose to watch what we think is interesting, what entertains us. Nobody's forcing us to click on certain websites or uh, read certain newspaper articles or uh, watch certain programs. I think one of the problems is just that we oftentimes don't know what's not being shown. Like what, you know, so we, we choose from what's presented to us in let's say our Facebook feed, right? And we think, well, this is based on some system that I'm not too clear on, but Facebook decided at some point that these were the articles that I wanted to read. And so I think that's, that's where I'm concerned, that there's just not enough transparency in the system, especially now as we move into the internet age, there's not enough transparency in terms of how, how is this system being shaped? Right? And so, no, I give audiences credit. I just think that you know, it's especially incumbent now on audiences to be, again, media literate, to understand the system. Everything I've showed you today is sort of an argument for why an academy like this one is so important. Right? Uh, you know, this is why Dr. Melky does this kind of work, in a sense, right? Because he, oh, but also he just likes to have his friends come and hang out. Um, but, but, but he believes, as I do very passionately, that this kind of education is very important for all of the reasons that I've just explained. 
that we really, this information needs to get out, not to create a bunch of people who think the world's a conspiracy, but to create people who are passionate about sharing and spreading media education. Just like 300 years ago, it was important that people learn to read and write, right? So that we could get out of feudal systems of government. Now I think it's just as important that we understand what's out there, and then on the second, on the other part of that, in which we're gonna hear later today, that we learn to engage and create and produce right, um, uh, outside of the system or in other sections of the system because then that gives a, uh, a voice, right? So I, I don't think people don't care. I just think they don't, um, they aren't given all the information they might need and that that can activate people, so hopefully. Thank you. شكرا لك يعطيك العافية عن المحاضرة القيمة لكن نحن المعلومات اللي حكيت حضرتها عن الشركات الاعلاميه نحن في منا عاد يراي بالمواضيع هي بس مو بهالشكل هذا اللي يعني حضرتك تطرقت بالنسبه لي انا بحكي عن حالي اقل ما يمكن لكن مثل ما حكيت حضرتك انه في شركات اعلاميه هدفها ترويج لمسلسلات لاعلانات لت... في اليوم نحن عندنا بنواجه بالعالم العربي بعض الشركات موجهه بقنوات عبر القنوات الدينيه و... وكثرت كثير ما بعرف اذا بروبا هيك في موجود هالشيء هذا يعني انه في قنوات توجه ديني بحت قديش ساهمت اليوم مثلا هي تاثيرها في طبعا منا قنوات بتمرر الرسائل يعني الى هدف منا ذات صبغه طائفيه ذات طبقه مناطقيه حسب يعني هي كثير اثرت سلبا على عقول الناس وساهمت في اذا ان الحراك اللي صار في الدول العربيه وبعض الشركات العربيه ساهم بتاجيج المواقف انت بتعرف هالقضايا هي بس باوروبا هل يا ترى في هيك قنوات وشو تاثيرها برايك انت على العالم او الشعب؟ Certainly, I think <clears throat> this idea of religious outlets and religious narratives and religious dialogue um, that in this part of the world, probably almost more than anywhere else, uh, is a crucial part of the media environment. I, we don't really have, I mean, I, I, could, I don't want to speak out of turn here. I mean, I think in the United States, there are religious channels, right? Um, the Christian Broadcasting Network is, is a big channel. Um, there are uh, news networks, one of them based in Utah, um, um, that, is, that is very influential. Um, there, are, there are religious organizations that have influential impacts in the media. Um, the Church of Scientology is one. You know, um, Scientologists are, are fairly influential in, in, in Hollywood. Um, there was a big uh, um, sort of controversy a couple of years ago when The Atlantic Magazine, which is a very important uh, journalistic magazine in the United States, ran an advertisement that seemed like an editorial that came from Scientology. But they're not very mainstream. And because we don't, you know, I'm not gonna say we don't have religious conflict in the United States, because we do, right? Um, there are people who feel very strongly about abortion, for instance, and that's based on their religious beliefs, and there have been bombings and shootings based on that, and there are certainly of radio talk show hosts who present a certain conservative, uh, religious, um, um, uh, I would say, uh, framework for how we understand the world. But I would say that the outcomes and the consequences are not as severe as what you would see here uh, in terms of the sort of like, for instance, the Sunni Shia sort of divide, right? Um, and and those, those networks are not, as, and I would say even less in Europe, um, but, but it's, it is an issue. Uh, but I would say that um, in, in this part of the world, it's not particularly concerning and, and worthy of study, right? And of dialogue, and of talking with students about it, right? And of analyzing what is the media uh, product being produced by a certain religious network look like compared to uh, other outlets, right? So we can analyze that content and try to understand it. And so I think the first step is always like, what is the problem? What is our question? And then as, as, as journalists and as academics, we say, well, how can we study that and understand it better? So um, it's a good question, but, but I don't think it's something we deal with on, as such a, on such a big scale as, uh, as here in the United States. But it certainly is part of our media landscape. Yeah, maybe this will be the last question. I know we have to go to, oh, two more? Okay, last two. Uh, if 
we as an audience uh, become more aware, or at least aware enough, to be able to filter news? Would that change the news production <coughs> model? How, if yes, and to what extent? That's a very good question. Um, I think it can make a difference, I do. It would have to happen on a large scale, right? Um, to me, it can't be the only sort of uh, um, uh, model. But I do think that, you know, in those instances, and there have been times in the United States where a certain story or a certain behavior on the part of the media company has changed because audience has said, if you keep producing this kind of content, we're no longer going to consume it, right? And so that, I think that can have, I mean, if, it, if you're talking about the bottom line, right? Um, yes, and there are instances of that. So I do think that that is one option. But it would have to be a very concentrated and well-coordinated campaign um, that would get people to say, look, this kind of content we're just not going to consume because we see that it's biased or we have problems with what it's, uh, how, how it's producing the news, etc. Um, and so, 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 so that, can, that can happen, certainly. Uh, but I don't think it's the only thing that, that, that works. Um, I think that um, some of it can be regulatory, right? So um, in the United States, a lot of the laws we used to have to prevent companies from becoming monopolies have been overturned, right? And so it used to be that at once one, a TV station couldn't own a newspaper in the same market. Right? But now, you can have a TV station that's owned by the local internet provider, which also owns the local radio network, which also uh, uh, owns the local internet provider and the cable, right? And so, um, a part of it can be regulatory, right? There can be policies. And then I think part of it is education, like we're talking about here. Not just on the part of students, but I think journalists as well, right? And so I think it has to be a multifaceted approach. But I do think, like, in educating audiences about what they're consuming, bias that's in those stories, what those stories, where they come from, it can make a difference. And there have been, I, mean, I can't think of any right this second, but I know there have been cases where people have said, look, if that's the kind of news that's going to be produced, we're going to look elsewhere. So I think it's definitely part of it. Shukram jazeelan ala muhala wa qayyima lati qaddamtumuha. أحس أحسست عندما استمعت إليك أنني أقرأ لهيربرت شيلر متلاعبون بالعقول سؤالي كيف نعتبر أو كيف كيف يمكننا أن نعتبر أفلام سينمائية مثل هذا جود نايت جود لاك إيرن بالكوفيتش جون ستيوارت في برامجه هذه هل هي عبارة عن متنفسات حتى لا يحدث الانفجار أو حتى لا تنكشف الأمور في لدى المجتمع الأمريكي عن طريقة عمل وسائل الإعلام if a, if a new uh, media organization, uh, if someone wants to start a new media organization in the Arab world, how, co how could it compete with those dominating? I'm talking about uh, objective media organization, which addresses the truth to the public. That's my question. Okay, so uh, both good questions. One about movies such as Good Night and Good Luck, or uh, The Insider, which was the other one that I shared, and also how how would you enter into a media landscape that is heavily monopolized? So I would say, you know, yeah, the problem with movies like Good Night and Good Luck or The Insider is that they're produced much long after the <laughs> the, uh, the what happened, what took place, right? So we're learning in the history, but what does it have to do with our present moment? I would say that, um, and I'll show a little of my own bias here, um, I think documentary films are one of, the, one of the places you can look to for um, stories that are not yet, have not yet um, finished, right? So um, a great example would be um, Michael Moore in the United States, Fahrenheit 9-11, Sicko. Uh, he makes films about uh, current issues that are affecting sort of our culture and our society. Right, um, and, he, and he said pretty clearly when he produced Fahrenheit 9/11. This was right before Bush was reelected. He was hoping that that film would 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 you know keep Bush from being reelected. That wasn't the case, um, but it was produced during the moment. You know, so I think movies because they are so expensive and um, they cost so much and it takes so much to make them, they tend to follow rather than lead. But I do think documentary films can make an impact. Um, 
there's a, a, a filmmaker I love who, who did a, a film on fracking, right, which is the exploration of, you know, natural gas and, and, and gas that it's called. And, and that film was incredibly influential, right, in sort of thinking about what's happening now, right? It wasn't really being covered in the mainstream media. Um, in, in the United States, in Detroit and Flint, Michigan, there was a water poisoning crisis where um, there was lead in the water in poor communities. And um, the mainstream media, the sort of large corporate outlets, were very late to the story, right? But there were other outlets. Um, one uh, is called Democracy Now!, which I listen to a lot. They were covering it well ahead, right? So I think that even outside of the pressures of uh, sort of mainstream media and, and ratings, I think once that story got out, everybody covered it because it's a big story. But I think what you have to look to is sort of, I think documentaries are a great option. I think alternative press is a great option. I, I, I think if we rely on Hollywood, <laughs> it's trouble, right? They'll, they'll make a movie, but only once uh, it's over. Um, but I think there are journalists and there are filmmakers and there are, there are you know, alternative outlets out there that, that do cover the stories. And hey, you know, all of us can help to promote that now. You have 500 Facebook friends, tell them about it. Maybe they'll tell their 500, right? So, so those, I think we have to look towards alternative outlets and a lot of them have been growing and becoming more influential. So to your point, I think that um, it's amazing to see how many alternative media um, are maybe not incredibly successful in terms of money, but in terms of impact, they can be, right? And we saw this in Egypt, there were alternative outlets that were covering the uprisings. Um, I think the internet is the place to go, right? I don't think, you know, trying to rely on traditional broadcasting or radio or television or newspapers is really viable anymore, partly because they're all closing, right? There's just too many pressures, advertising is going away, but also because I think if you're smart about your strategy, you can have an impact. Um, and I, I, I think that looking to alternative networks and leveraging social networks and social media that works for you, I think can be a great way to create. Because I do think, to get back to the question about audiences, I think there's a thirst for alternative information. I think people know about this, right? They just don't know where to go to find alternative voices. Um, like, like I mentioned, for me it's Democracy Now! The Democracy Now! Is, airs on 900 radio stations in the United States. They have millions of followers on the internet. I, I listen to them as a podcast, right? They don't have corporate funding. They'll bring no Chomsky on, which hardly any other network will ever do, right? Um, and they're out there, and they're not profit-oriented, but they're looking to sort of um, tell stories that maybe are being covered. So I think, I think looking to digital forms of media production um, is the way to go, especially as even within the Arab world, more and more people are getting access, whether through mobile or online, the digital divide is closing. Right, so you can reach more and more people. I think that's the way to go. Um, I think last question. That's it. Oh, that was it? Okay, sorry. Thank you all so much.